we have uh, contact. Oh, he made it. Well done. Very good. Hello. Can you hear us? I can hear now. Yes. Wonderful. Sorry, I thought I sent you the uh, invitation already, but uh, clearly not. Oh, you probably did. Well, you know, you very well might have done, but all of a sudden you guys have disappeared and I'm looking at me twice. So one second. Um, Hang on. I don't, I don't know what I did. Oh, I bet I touched that. No, that's the other way around. Trust that. Um, there, now you're back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So we are we have a good crowd here one two three four times so we've got 23 people oh my 20, goodness 23 devices which is more than 23 people um and uh i think we it's um the, in where i come from there's this saying that uh we, we talk about the monkey in the zoo everybody knows who the monkey is but no mon the monkey knows nobody and uh <laughs> pastor Weed, you're the monkey so we all know who you are, and uh, you are the reason we are here. How does that make you feel? But uh, we've got a we've got like a, a monkey. There you go. We've got a motley, motley crew here of all kinds of people. Some some are uh, in the UK, some are in the States. Uh, one is in Malta. We've got some who are Lutheran, some who are not yet Lutheran, some who are not Lutheran. Um, I don't think we've got any post-Lutherans, but we have some pre-Lutherans. And so, so we've got a whole bunch of people here. I was just wondering uh, whether we might start with a quick round of introductions where you all just say your name. You don't have to put your camera on if you don't want to. You're all muted, more or less. So if you just unmute yourself for three seconds, uh, say your name and say something that is uh, so something about yourself, um, perhaps something about yourself, as in particularly in, in, in relation to the... Uh, uh, who you are as a Christian, um, and as, as so that uh, Pastor Whedon knows what on earth he's dealing with and what he's let himself in for. So, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll if I work in the order that you're on my screen. So, um, I think m most of you know who I am. I'm, I'm Tapani Simayoki. I'm the pastor of Our Saviour Lutheran Church in Fareham, in on the south coast of England, and uh, I will be the chief assistant to the monkey tonight. So, I'll be I'll be sort of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, run, run, running the uh, sort of reading some of the questions and, and and hopefully keeping things going so if things go terribly wrong uh send your uh hate mail to me please uh, <laughs> tim you're my next on my screen uh tim i am a church of england minister in shrewsbury which is called mid middle of england um i've been ordained ministry about 15 years now uh rosemary you're muted. You have to unmute first and then speak. Well, before Rosemary, just before we say anything, if you don't know this, if you hold the space bar down, if you're on a computer and, and on on um, on Zoom, if you hold the space bar down, it unmutes you temporarily. Right, Rosemary, go ahead. <laughs> no. Okay, we'll come back to you. Oh, there you go. Hi, Speak. Um, yeah. um, I'm all right now. Yeah, yeah. So, so Hello, you know. I'm just one of Tapley's congregation. Not just. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. This is Rosemary. Annabelle? Um, am I? Yeah, I'm Annie. I'm Annabelle. I've been at Tapley's uh, church, our saviour, for quite a few years now. And I was previously in the Church of England. But... Um, Came to the Lutherans. <laughs> and you're in Malta. And I'm in Malta now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Reya. Okay. Yeah. Need to unmute. There you go. Okay, sorry. So I'm Reya. I'm originally from Finland and obviously a Lutheran. Um, lifelong Lutheran. I've lived in England for about 30 years and it was only this during this pandemic and lockdown that I've learned that there's a Lutheran church in Britain. Uh, uh, so I've been, um, um, so I just sort of joined last summer, the Lutheran group here in, in, in Britain, in England. Yep. 
in Oxford, no less. Mm. David and Cynthia? Yeah, we're David and Cynthia, and we're from Northern Ireland. And I think there's a few other Northern Irish accents I've heard. And I see there's a few other Davids as well. So there's quite a few of us. Um, I was a Pentecostal pastor for a few years. And now that uh, we have joined Tappanese Bible study, and we're well on the way just to kind of being Lutheran. But there's no Lutheran churches in Ireland. That's the problem. <laughs> Steve. Okay. Who's next? <laughs> Who's next? That's you, Steve. Oh, it's me. So I'm Steve Levy. I'm the minister of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Swansea. Uh, but fascinated uh, by all things Lutheran and have become a very good friend of Hans Feeney, uh, who we had over to speak at a minister's conference that we ran. And uh, the next thing that happened was a pandemic. So I don't know what that's about, but there you are. That's us. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Steve. David. Yeah, I uh, just found out there's some more Northern Irish people here. So that's, that's me. Uh, a bit miffed because I thought I was going to be the special fella, but no, I'm just another Irishman. <laughs> uh, my uh, background, I come from a reformed background and uh, just over the last couple of years, I've realized how so much of my Christian life was based upon what I was doing, and it ended up I got quite burnt out. Uh, then a couple of years ago, I found a copy of Luther's Small Catechism, and uh, read it, changed my life, and from, I suppose I describe myself now as I'm, I'm making my way towards uh, Lutheranism, so really excited about tonight. So thanks so much. Thank you. Tom Martin. I am, uh, I'm uh, in South Wales. Uh, I'm associate pastor of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. I um, grew up uh, in a like independent church, uh, but brethren background way back. So thank, you. thank you, Ian. You already mentioned a few things, but if you say quickly again. Yeah, uh, I'm from Illinois. Uh, I grew up in a, a very, very strict Catholic church, Latin mass only. Uh, senior year of high school, I became Lutheran. Uh, and now I am at Concordia Seminary St. Louis, and I'm on Vicarage up in Michigan. Great. Thank you. Bruce? Hi. I'm Bruce Latimer. I was uh, brought up to go to the Church of Scotland, and uh, I never joined. I became, which is Presbyterian uh, Church of Scotland. Then I became a Quaker for a few years, Then I've been a Lutheran for quite a few years up at Petswood and I go to Bright Mission because it's slightly closer and well, I know Tappany and people. <laughs> yeah. So Great. that's it really. Yeah. Thank I, you. I just like the sort of position on various things. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Great to see you. Mike Navarro. Hello. Uh, Hello. We uh, <coughs> excuse me. We originally Anglicans, uh, and when the Lutheran <laughs> church opened in Fairham in uh, 1972. Uh, round about 1973, uh, we joined the church there. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, first pastor was uh, a guy called uh, Robert Brewer, who was Canadian. And uh, so uh, we've been members ever since. <laughs> Mike and Avril are charter members of our church. We sort of he's taken. We've been joined by more and more people, and I'm I'm kind of keen to get on. So if I if you don't mind too much, I'm just going to speed up a little bit, <laughs> introducing uh, a few people uh, just to get to get things moving very fast. So we've got Mike and Pavy Smith. If you wave, uh, who are members of my congregation. So is Barbara Higgins, uh, long time member of our uh, of our congregation. Uh, and there's uh, Carol Cheesemore who's also a member of our church. Uh, my wife, Sarah, is, is here. Uh, and my daughter, Hannah, is there as well. Uh, we've got John, who's uh, helping running the thing, who set up the whole thing. He's a chairman of our Saviour Lutheran Church. Uh, we've got David Lusby, who is also a very long time member and vice chairman of this congregation. Uh, there you go. We've got Polish several people off in, in, in a few seconds. <laughs> Andy, say a few words by yourself. Andy Milligan. 
Hi, uh, good evening, Andy Milligan. Um, I, I'm another Northern Irishman, uh, although I live I live just outside um, Tappanies Parish or just in that area. Um, yeah, my background is in Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Um, uh, although most, I guess, most of my Christian life has been a, in an evangelical, non-denominational context. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, seeking and uh, learning more about the ancient uh, Christian traditions and and. Lutheranism is, is one on that list. So, and I've I've been a Will Whedon fan since uh, the ten minute Bible hour video, uh, which I rewatched again <laughs> today. Uh, and it, it's uh, if anybody hasn't seen that, um, maybe the character will come through tonight. But the uh, the passion that, that this guy has for for uh, for Christ and for for his church is, is really wonderful to see. Great, thank you, <laughs> Ardith. Um, be on, yep. Um. Well, I have a really out there kind of checkered theological background, but I can say that I was finally confirmed in the Lutheran Church on September 13th of last year. So very and, happy to be here. <laughs> and where are you? Oh, I'm in the States in North Carolina. Very good. Lovely oh. to have you with us. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Rob, do you mind just saying quickly who you are? Uh, hi, I'm Rob. I'm from Portsmouth in England. Uh, I recently became Christian just a couple of months ago. Still quite new to all this. Very good to have you with us. Wonderful. Cool. That'll be me. Um, yes, I'm uh, Anglican by tradition. Um, recently discovering the Lutheran Church, although not in person, because I'm in Southwest England and practically no one else is unless you speak Polish. So um, that's who I am. Very good. Also, Southwest England, Matt, do you mind just quickly introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, that was my dad, um, <laughs> by the way. That last guy. <laughs> um, I, my story is pretty similar to David's. Um, I used to got a reformed background, um, got a little bit burnt out, um, to say the least. Um, been away from the church for, for several years now, but become very interested in the Lutheran church and got put in touch with uh, Pastor Tapani and uh, invited here, and here I am. Lovely to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, we also have an Esteban Lopez. You want to say a few words about yourself? We have a Lee Jones. Hello, <laughs> I'm uh, from South Wales and I'm in the capital of Wales, uh, Cardiff. Um, and I grew up uh, not far away. Um, yeah, converted uh, at 16 and yeah, love in church life. And I'm interested in the Lutheran. Uh, Sort of things is uh yeah some sort of kinship uh, with with all the stuff that you teach so uh loving it absolutely loving it great to have you with us thank you sean do you want to say a quick hello hi i'm sean um what was a uh, yeah I'm, I'm from uh minot north dakota great to have you with us yeah thank you and we've got charles harper No. <laughs> and just joining us while we wait are Eric and Adrian, and like I'll introduce them because they are uh, about to become members of, of our church, have been going through membership coming from a Baptist background. So they are paving the way for Steve Levy and his cohort. Uh, have been Baptist <laughs> and and, and uh, about to be members of our Saviour Lutheran Church in Fairham, just in, not in, in fact, only, only a few days time. And it's great to have have you all with us thank you that took a bit of time but i think it's, it's 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 worthwhile it's really great to have people from lots of different backgrounds lots of different places and uh i, I suspect with lots of different kinds of questions um it's an it's a free for all um i don't know what past weed and what your kind of what how far your expertise why it runs into i said earlier to my bible study group that you probably aren't that hot in astrophysics but so we'll try to keep <laughs> questions to topics that you are expert on uh, but uh, as long as you ask it in good faith and, and, and are reasonably polite, then I don't think we've got anything particularly off limits uh, as such. And to, just to get things kicked off, I've got a whole list of questions that people have sent in, uh, in advance of uh, tonight's meeting. Um, and, and just a couple of questions. The, the first question from David Robinson, uh, David and Cynthia, was... Are you from a Lutheran background? And if not, what attracted you to Lutheranism? So tell us a little about yourself and then answer that question. 
Okay, I am not from a Lutheran background. My family was sort of uh, Southern Methodist and they weren't all that devout in that. I mean, they went to church when they went back to the, I was raised right outside of Washington, DC, but home for my parents was down in the wilds of Virginia. And only when they went home, did they go to church. So they were Methodist, but they never even had me baptized or like that. Um, and I was at a ball game one day with a friend when I was about uh, 11 years old. And I don't like sports. It's just not my thing. So I was not paying very much attention. And these two boys were sitting beside me and they asked me, hey, do you know what you need to know to be saved? And you'll never guess what they were. They were Roman <laughs> Catholics. It was, it, was the time, it was the time of the great Vatican Council. And they were, you know, that church was really, there were a lot of people that were very um, on fire, if you will. So they, they, they wanted to know, did I need it at all? And I was like, no, I actually don't. So you know what they told me basically was, well, you need to believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Oh, like, do the Apostles' Creed. Oh, you become muted, Bill. Ooh. Okay, is that better? Yeah, that's better, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you got to, as far okay. as the Apostles' Creed. Okay, I wonder if I just got so loud that it cut me off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so what what happened with these um, these Roman Catholic kids? I, I've lost you again, Tepani. I don't know where I, you went. Carry on, carry on. Okay, okay. Uh, they, uh, they, you know, th that sort of set questions in my head. So when I went at home, I asked my mom, and because they were Catholic, the question came out as, "Hey, mom." we're not Catholic, right? What are we? And, and, uh, you know, that resulted in, you know, hell no, we're not Catholic. <laughs> we're Protestant. Well, I was a nerd for the, the encyclopedia. I went and pulled out my encyclopedia. Um, I didn't like ball games, but I love my world book encyclopedia. And I read about Protestants, which sent me to Lutheran. And I said, mom, you know anything about these Lutherans? And she's like, hey, our neighbors two doors up they go to the church right on the hill. You can walk. Now, my mom didn't drive. Um, she had polio when she was little, so she, she was good. My dad usually slept in on Sunday mornings, so I walked to the Lutheran church, and uh, wow, nothing prepared me. For, I mean, I have been to church with my parents at the Methodist church, but nothing prepared me for what met me when I walked through that door. Um, you know, it was a beautiful congregation with a lot of really strong music and singing. And um, I mean, the vestments, I was like, whoa, whoa, what are these people floating around up here in white? What's that all about? Um, and uh, they stuck me into Sunday school class. And my Sunday school teacher said right away, um, have you been baptized? And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. So um, she marched me down to the pastor and said, we got to get this boy baptized. He lives on the other side of Georgia Avenue. And I don't want him. <laughs> what happened to me gets killed on the way home. We need to get him baptized. And, and he's like, look, we have to talk to his parents first, but we will we'll do this. So anyway, a couple of weeks later, I was baptized. And I can remember my, the day of my baptism with, with great joy. Um, and from there on, I've been a uh, Lutheran Christian. Brilliant. And uh, how long have you been a pastor? Oh, my goodness. Um, I am closing in... Uh, I hate doing figures. You said I didn't have to do things that I'm not really good at. So oh, I, was, right. I, was, I was ordained in 86. Okay. So, um, you know, I've, I've years. been a... Oh, okay. 34 years. Very good. And now you work for Lutheran <laughs> Public Radio as well as the parish, yes. right? Yes. Just before we get into other questions from listeners, do, do you want to do a very, very quick plug of your podcast? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I, it's such a hoot to do. Um, we have a podcast called The Word of the Lord Endures Forever, and all it does is walk through the Bible verse by verse with an exposition that's about, it's about 15 minutes study every day. That's about it. Um, and the, the goal is to actually be informed as we're reading what the scripture says there by the church's um, great teachers in the past, both in the early church and in the Reformation, and also, of course, by the church's liturgy, how we have prayed these texts. So um, it's it's a great, great joy to be able to do that. 
and uh, you can find it wherever you can find podcasts. Uh, right. All right. Yep. All all good. God. All good. Uh, 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 podcast uh, collections will have the word of the Lord endures forever. The fifteen minutes. I've, I've, they're, they're very good. Um, I've enjoyed the, the ones listened to you so far. You've done Matthew and uh, what was that? Uh, that was uh, I think somebody who shouldn't have been here. They're gone. Okay. Don't worry. Sorry, that was a, that was a glitch. I apologize for that uh, to everyone. This is the danger with having a open Zoom meetings. Um, yeah, so you, so far you've done quite a few books of the uh, books of the uh, New Testament. John, Hebrews, is it Matthew? Um, we've done John, Hebrews. Ma we're in Matthew right now, and we've done Romans. Rome, that's and right. uh, next next up, I think is Hosea. Wonderful. So I do I do uh, recommend it to you. Right. Um, here's a question uh, from uh, Tim. Do you might do you want to ask it yourself, or do you want me to ask for you what you sent me? Is to it me? my first one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um basically what is regeneration um so you know baptismal regeneration what does that mean for you given that you know, i think in the kind of reformed theology would be that regeneration cannot be undone you know you're brought from death to life um so if people are regenerated in baptism then the reform goes but people get baptized and fall away so they weren't regenerate in the first place. So what is regeneration given in the kind of Lutheran context? Well, great question. And first of all, I have to say, Tim, you were Shrewsbury, right? So That's right, yeah. this is this is CAD file territory, man. It is indeed, yeah. Um, <laughs> I love that series. Um, regeneration, I, I, obviously it means to be born again, to be born anew. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is it connects you to God. That's at the heart of what it is. It connects you to God in a saving way so that the life that is inside of God, you come to actually share. And that's what makes it be the gift of eternal life. But it's also really clear from Jesus teaching in the new Testament and, 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 and the instrument the, the giving instrument through which that happens, we do believe is baptism or the preaching of the word. Um, but the, the receiving end on your part is faith. And it certainly is the teaching of the New Testament that it's possible to fall away from faith. So Jesus, when he does his parable of the, um, the, the, the sower and the seeds, he said, these are those who believe for a time. But then, for, I mean, so, so it's not that they weren't regenerate. They're, they're, they were born again. They were born anew. But they let go of, of, of that word, which alone can sustain them in the saving faith. And as a result, they became disconnected from God. Now, it doesn't mean they're permanently disconnected from God. It does mean that, that God always wills that his people be connected to him. But he he absolutely only gives that gift in and through faith being being received and, and retained. And it is possible um, to drive the Holy Spirit and the gift of, of faith away from one by intentional, purposeful um, rebellion and sin against God. Um, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. And Saint 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 Stephen. Tim, do you do you want to come back? Does that answer your question? Um, I know it's a big question and we could spend the whole rest of the evening on that, but I mean, it just leads into, um, so I've seen quite a few uh, Calvinistic folk on Twitter saying things like, if I could fall away, I would fall away. My only hope is, is, is the preservation of God. Um, you know, the P in tulips, all right. Um, so, so regeneration, um, yeah, so it brings up issues of assurance, like how do I know I'm not going to fall mm -hmm. away tomorrow? Or next year, mm -hmm. um, and I had to guard against the kind of fear of that. Well, the great gift against the fear of falling away. Well, first of all, there is a godly there is a godly fear to falling away, right? There is such a thing that we would say as carnal security, which basically runs along the lines of, "Hey, God loves to forgive, and I love to sin, so I don't need to worry about this. I'm saved," and off you go. And it, when, when, when you have that kind of rebellion going on, you do not have saving faith going on. Um, and we just need to be really clear on that. Impenitence and saving faith cannot exist together. They, they are mutually opposed to each other. 
So um, the, the great comfort though, when a person is alarmed over, oh my goodness, I look at my great sin, I see, I see how weak I am in the faith, how am I ever going to make it through? Well, the answer is God himself assures and gives this comfort in the sacraments. The sacraments remain this bulwark. You know, whether I believe this or that or not, this is true. God says to me, your sins are gone. The blood of Jesus has washed them, covered them, removed them. They are history in my sight. This is my promise and guarantee to you in the waters of baptism. And then you get to cling to that and hold to that and say, yeah, you know what? It's not my feelings. It's not how I'm thinking about it. It's God's promise to me. And I'm going to hold tight to that. And similarly with the sacrament of the altar, especially with the sacrament of the altar, when we worry about how do I know my sins are forgiven? And Jesus hands, he says, open your mouth, open wide. <laughs> you know, here's my body. Here's my blood. This is what has wiped away the sins of the entire world. Do you think you are somehow survived that? I don't think so. They're gone. And so this comfort that comes into our lives from the sacraments is huge. And, you know, for Lutherans also, absolution is, is considered sacramental or a sacrament. And so also when you go and confess your sins um, to a Christian brother or before the pastor and the pastor absolves you, literally, he's, you know, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. So when the pastor remits the sins, we know, okay, there's a promise from Jesus. I can count on this. It's as certain and done in heaven as it is right here on earth. And all of those are ways that we set our hearts and consciences at peace. There's certainly somebody who is not living in that kind of rebellion um, that would say, you know, hey, I don't really care. I've just, I, I've got my get out of hell free card in my back pocket and I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. The person that, you know, all true Christians, I think instead have the other problem where we, we are very much aware of our sin and of our failing. And you have this weird paradox that the nearer we draw to him, the more we become aware of our sin and how evil we are. He was like, the person who is not close to God doesn't have that picture. But the closer you get, the more you go, how can he possibly be forgiving me? Um, and, and that's why I think the sacraments become so very, very precious to us. I hope that answers it. Great, thank you. Hmm? Uh, thank you, thank you for the that. question. Uh, and, and, and obviously also uh, for the um, answer. I've, here's a completely different kind of question. This is from somebody who's not uh, with us, but is probably going to watch it later on. Uh, Joel Dietrichs, who asks, what should a pastor do for a young person who refuses to go to church with his or her parents, who refuses confirmation classes and instruction? Uh, and when the, you know, for, you know, parents are sad and frustrated, what, what, what should you do? Well, the first thing a pastor should do about that is to pray for that child and to be devoted to praying for that child, for the gift of repentance. I honestly think it's there's a strength to a child saying, no, I'm not going to do it, rather than saying, sure, mom, I'll go, and not paying any attention and disregarding it all. Um, I, I actually had it happen once here in the United States where the kid just flat out told me, he says, I don't believe it. I don't believe the Bible stuff. I don't believe it. I don't want any part of it. And um, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not going to keep coming. And it was really hard. Um, his parents were devastated. And I'm still praying for Thomas. I, 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 I have hopes that he will still turn to the faith. He, he, was, he was baptized as a little child. He was taught the Bible as a little child. But as he grew in years, he really did rebel and said, I don't believe it. Um, so I think that aside from that, you have to respect the person's, if they're saying, no, I really don't believe it. And, well, and that's also different from saying, I'm just not doing what you're telling me to do. In which case the pastor probably should remind the kid, well, there is a fourth commandment and you need to obey your parents. Um, if they're saying, hey, a condition of living in our house is we go together and worship at church. You need to do that. So, I mean, those are two different approaches, but I think that they actually both cohere. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I've got a question from John. John, do you want to ask your own, ask your own question uh, about dispensationalism? Or do you want me to read it out? Okay, I'll, I'll read. So this is from John, who's, who's our co-host here. He said, I've experienced much confusion and conflict due to various dispensational doctrines over my years as a Christian. 
most of the time being completely oblivious to what dispensationalism actually was. Have you had any dealings with this issue and do you consider it a danger? If so, what would you identify as the chief dangers? Um, could I, if, if <laughs> maybe for the benefit of, of, of the audience, if, if, if I, would you be willing and able to give us a, a one line definition of what's meant by dispensationalism and then see what, what would be your response to be to it? Oh my goodness. A one line definition. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, sure, uh, sure, sure. down to one line. Short definition. Um, Very long line. Oh, okay. Dispensationalism believes that God has different ways of dealing with people across different times of history. And that there is a way that he dealt with the with with the, the with the world after the Jews rejected the Christian faith. But he's not done with the Jews. He's going to actually come back and do a saving job up on the Jews. And before all of these events happen, the dispensationalists do not always agree on the sequence of the events, but they do tend to have such things as before this happens, Christ is going to, um, sometimes it's a secret return in glory. Well, he'll rapture out his people and then they will get to enjoy his kingdom. Um, there's also the seven year tribulation that his people are being raptured away from, so they don't have to experience it. And then you come, you know, the great throne judgment, all that stuff. The big mark of dispensationalism to me that shows it's really screwy is you have to have Christ end up returning more than once. And, uh, you know, to bring, unless you're a post-millennial, which is really another form of dispensationalism that's not very popular, but where basically Christ returns and things just get better and better and better and better, right? So my, my, general take on dispensationalism is it tends to focus people on studying signs of the end that they want to just sort of nail down in a way where Jesus said, hey, the day and that hour, I, he said, I do not know, the angels do not know, the father alone knows, and he says, so you need to be ready all the time, and you need to remember that things are going to be going on as normal, It'd be like the days of Noah, he said, there's an ark waiting to save you, that's the church and you can run into the ark and be safe and then when the floods of judgment come when this world is consumed with fire at the return of christ it's not going to be a problem meanwhile you're in the age of tribulation the church literally lives that way john one or john says in revelation one that he is your partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in jesus so you don't have to wait for the tribulation to come trust me just hey look you guys are in lockdown again, right? I mean, you want tribulation? We got tribulation. <laughs> we got all kinds of troubles and sorrows and griefs filling this world. And uh, and God can use and bless us through them all. They None of them have the power to destroy those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, to answer your question, John? Yeah, it does. It's, it's, it, it's not so much of a question, really. It was... I. I Basically, when, when right from the time when I first became a Christian, the, there were things that really bothered me because I could see that they weren't clear in the Bible, like, for instance, the, the rapture doctrine, etc. But the, as, as I left the charismatic, the hyper sort of charismatic church, and I, I went to Calvary Chapel first, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I experienced a real sort of conflict um, and a serious conflict as well when when I started uh, looking at, at sort of uh, amillennialism and what it actually mm -hmm. meant and it, and it seemed to fit with the scriptures far more clearly than what I was being taught but once you start to explore that avenue in many dispensational churches they it's a, it's a it can really create a, a world of pain for you uh, and yes the, and the, the one thing that I've I've been aware of as I look backwards now is that the dispensational teaching really sort of it's almost like a, a, a smoke filled room how the smoke disappears and gets under the, into all the nooks and crannies. It seems to find its way into all different sort of um, types of churches in, in different yeah. ways. And it's it's so hard to nail down. It took me probably 15 years before I even realized where it was coming from. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I I think that's profound. And and if you, I, you will, I, I know you probably heard this from them. They'll say, well, the problem with you amillennialist is you just don't actually believe what the scriptures say. It says a thousand year reign. Exactly. Um, yeah. 
Well, you come back with, yeah, and it also says that it's the souls of those who have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus who are raised. And none mm. of them teach that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's always bigger than that. So at the same time that, uh, that they're accusing us of not reading it literally, it's like, but you're not reading it literally either. Well, no one should be reading the book of Revelation as though it were, um, I don't know, uh, a, a history book. It's not a history book. It's a revelation. It's an apocalypse. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's it's much more akin to poetry, I think, than anything else. I, you read it, and it's designed to fill you with the peace and comfort that comes from knowing no matter how big and bad these enemies of God's people are right now, they're not going to win. And so John just goes, you know, vision after vision, picture after picture, and here's how they lose, and here's how they lose, and here's how they lose, and here's how God's people finally end up where love has triumphed over all and the kingdom reigns. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank good, you. Good question and, and a helpful answer, I think. And let's, uh, Tim, um, while, while we're speaking of uh, uh, sort of other, other sort of Protestant angles, do you want to ask you a question about election? Um, it's like sort of answered, but um, come back to me. I I need to work out. I think I think it's been answered. You think so? Okay. Let me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Um, uh, David, uh, David in Northern Ireland. Uh, David, Julie, uh, you you've got a question about uh, being, yeah, being think, Lutheran in a foreign land. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, Tabby, you've got a lovely accent that sounds so much better than mine. So it might be better if you ask it. People might be able to understand it a bit better. <laughs> I no such thing. You, you, you got. Uh, I, I absolutely love uh, Northern Irish accents, but uh, I'm happy to read it if you like. Um, it says, um, um, "Hi, Pastor Whedon. Really benefited from your videos on YouTube. I feel like I'm just past the halfway point from Geneva to Wittenberg." In, I'm in Northern Ireland. Sadly, there are no Lutheran churches that I can attend. Also, I'm worried about conflict with my reformed elders due to my new Lutheran views with no available Lutheran church to go to. What advice would you give to me? Oh, I, I honestly do not know what to tell someone in that situation unless I were going to talk to um, Pastor Tapani and say, so why isn't there a Lutheran mission going over in Ireland right now? Um, can the um, can the church there in England do something to reach further across the you know across that little not little across the Irish Sea to uh, to to plant something there? I I, I, I honestly do not do not know. Um, well, it, I think it's I, hard. I think it's I a hard one. Answer that a little bit uh, because uh, I've already I, mean, I spoke with David and Cynthia, uh, and there's another gentleman who's unfortunately wasn't able to join us uh, was, uh, tonight. Uh, I was hoping that he would, Jim. Uh, but uh, there is there is a small but significant number, more than the two or three mentioned by Jesus in Matthew's gospel, uh, uh, who, who have you need. <laughs> so um, I think I think there's something we need to look into. It's just the current lockdown and things makes it impossible really to start yeah. start anything in person as yet. Uh, but I think the short answer is that we uh, it's my hope and prayer that as soon as we, we can travel freely again, that we'll 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 have to start something. That's a blessed thing. That's great. Yeah, yeah. We're not a, we're not very well resourced church. We can't just come and and you know drop drop tens of thousands of pounds and and, and just plant a church. But uh, we can build from the bottom up. And my experience is that those things last tend to last better than the ones that are helicoptered in. So, so watch yes. this. Stay in touch. I think is the short answer to that. Yeah. Uh, very good, um, Andy. Milligan, you had a couple of questions. If I preface your, uh, if you, again, Andy, you're, you're more than welcome to read your, uh, ask your own questions. Can I preface it with uh, David uh, Robinson's question uh, about uh, the fact that you regularly quote St. John Chrysostom? Is he your favorite church father? And if so, why? Beyond a shadow of doubt, St. John Chrysostom is my favorite church father. Um, I love him because of his insight into the scripture. Because he was from the Antiochian school, he tends not to to the, um, shall we call them flights of fancy, that we sometimes find um, from, from the books from North Africa and also in Western Europe. Uh, they tended to be pretty literal in their read, and, and yet he just goes through 
and and honestly deals with text after text, I just find him to be a, a, a source of huge refreshment. And, and sort of tying into maybe where some of the questions are headed, can I just share a few of my all-time favorites from him yeah, go ahead. that actually I think impinge on this? Um, first of all, he wrote in a homily on repentance and the church. He said, look, regarding the things that I say, I should supply even the proofs. So I will not seem to rely on my own opinions, but rather prove them with scripture so that the matter remains certain and steadfast. So, I mean, his picture of, of the role of scripture there is, is really strong. Um, and let me get to this other one. Um, I got so many places where I've collected these things. Um, I'm sorry. One second, there we go. No, I didn't put it down here. I thought I had it in this collection. But um, there's another quote that it runs, it's from his Acts commentary, where he basically says, so, you know, there comes a, a, a person among you and he says, I don't know who to choose. You guys are all in conflict with each other. Every one of you is saying, I teach the truth. How is a person supposed to judge and know this? And Chrysostom's answer was really shocking. He simply said, well, if we bid you believe, you know, complicated arguments, it would have to remain uncertain. But if we just bid you believe what the scriptures say, and it's plain and simple, well, then the person who agrees with the scripture is the one who's right, and the other one is far from this rule. So Chrysostom laid it out that way for, um, for his hearers. He's like, you know, where, what do scriptures actually teach? And the one who agrees with the scripture, that's the church. That's, that's where you need to be. Find the one that agrees with the, with the sacred scriptures. And, and he also had, um, he, I mean, he had so many statements that were really powerful on, uh, on grace and, and faith. Um, like uh, he, would, he, he said, hold on, let me get to that one quote. Oh, never mind. I found that quote. Let me give you the actual quote from, from Acts, if I can. I just stuck it in the wrong spot. There comes a heathen and says, I wish to become a Christian, but I know not whom to join. There is much fighting and faction among you, much confusion. Which doctrine and I, am I to choose? How shall you, we answer him? Each of you, says he, asserts, I speak the truth. No doubt this is in our favor. For if we told you to be persuaded by arguments, you might well be perplexed. But if we bid you believe the scriptures, and these are simple and true, the decision is easy for you. If any agree with the scriptures, he's the Christian. If any fight against them, he is far from this rule. Um, similarly, like, you know, a quote from him that just blows me away. They said that he who adhered to faith alone was cursed. But he, Paul, shows that he who adhered to faith alone is blessed. I mean, if Luther had actually read him in on the Romans commentary, I'm convinced Luther's um, insight would have come much earlier than it did. He knew him on Hebrew from the Hebrews commentary, which he's really good on. But I, I, I don't think Luther was familiar with him on the Romans commentary early on. And, and it kind of shows. So he, he misses a lot of his essential insights on that. But yeah, he's just definitely a great, great commentator on the scriptures. Can I just ask a question that of my own at this point? Do you think that principle still works when somebody says, I want to become a Christian, but you've got Baptists and Anglicans and Lutherans and Methodists, and then you've got Irish Methodists and, you know, who's got the truth? <laughs> and there's Lutherans of all varieties. Yes. No, I mean, I, I think it comes down to something as simple as this. It's like, pull out the scriptures and check it out. I mean, if I go to another church father that said the exact same thing, Cyril, as he was preaching into the catechumens in, in Jerusalem, he told them, look, even to me who is teaching you these things, don't give absolute credence unless you receive the proof from the divine scriptures. So he's telling the catechumens, you guys need to be judging what I'm teaching you on the basis of the scriptures. Can it be demonstrated from them? And I think that that's, a, 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 you know, people picture, now I put this, 
if, if you read the New Testament, you realize it teaches you very strongly the importance of tradition. It's there, right? I mean, there's false tradition, but it also teaches you the importance of holding to the traditions I have delivered to you. If you pay attention to the tradition, it teaches you sola scriptura. <laughs> it teaches you you must ground every dogma that you proclaim as God's revealed will in the written word of God. Um, now, sometimes people will point to there's a statement from St. Basil in On the Holy Spirit where, you know, he speaks about if you dis unwritten traditions, uh, he's mostly talking about liturgical traditions there. He says, you know, you're going you're gonna to damage the truth. Um, What's funny is th that's one place where Basil said that, but he has multiple places where he basically says, um, you know, if it's not in the scriptures, you just don't go there. The scriptures are what establishes the truth for the Christian period. So on the basis of that, would you say that in, at least in some senses, different Christian traditions arguing over the meaning of scripture is actually a positive thing? Absolutely. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I, I mean, Maybe we could even, instead of just using the word arguing, maybe we'll be a little less polemical and just say discussing, because mm -hmm. the church has been discussing the scriptures for a very, very, very long time. And the fun part is to actually listen in on the discussion across the centuries. Most of the time, you'll figure out that all your bright ideas, somebody else already thought of them before. And as you're reading along and, and learning from that, uh, you, I think, become ever more confirmed in the truth that the scriptures laid out. If somebody's really going uh, astray from from what the scripture teaches, I think it becomes manifest. So, um, I mean, I know people will say, "Hey, if you stop at the if you're at the, if you're at the Reformation and you look backwards, you just see two options: it's either Orthodox or Roman Catholic, right?" But if you look forward after this Protestant mess thousands and thousands of options surely something went kerflui here um and i think that kind of ignores the fact that looking backwards or forwards it's really a division of about you know four or five principles of authority either it's scripture alone which is what the lutherans insist on or it's scripture alone interpreted reasonably. I, I'm not trying to be unfair to the Calvinists, but I'm trying to be fair to how they will, you know, rein in some things that they, you know, well, scripture can't mean that because that's unreasonable. Um, and uh, then there is the principle that scripture is not actually um, the, the, the totality of the, the apostolic deposit. And so there must be something else besides and that, in fact, uh, can have either the Eastern form or the Roman Catholic form. But both of them have in common this, that they're saying what's in Scripture is not quite sufficient by itself. And then there's finally what I don't know how else to call it, except for the emotional argument that, you know, I determine the truth of God by how it by how I feel about it, um, which honestly is where a lot of um, a lot of the Pentecostal and uh, um assembly of god kind of churches have sort of wandered into um much more so i think in in the last 20 years than they were in their previous history so thank you that is a beautiful segue into andy's question uh <laughs> question so well more, more or less what was, the question. was planned I, I, was, I was going to say uh, it may warm your heart there are two books on my desk right now one is luther's christian freedom which was a gift from pastor tappany and the other is uh -huh. uh, some John Chrysostom's on wealth and, and uh, poverty. Poverty, so, actually, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, well, the, the, that was completely unplanned. That just happened to be the two that I was looking at earlier today. Um, no, yeah, there's a lot in what you said, which I guess sort of I'm trying to evolve the question I, I put to Tappany earlier. Um, I mean, my own, I sort of hinted in my intro, my, my own background, I've, you know, sort of came came from a, you know, sort of mainstream Methodist background, a lot of um, you know, evangelicalism in the last sort of 10, mm -hmm. 15 years. Um, but in the last couple of years, I've, I've discovered these guys called the Church Fathers who nobody ever told me about, right? And I picked up on the incarnation and I read this thing. And I thought, why has, I'm 35 years old and I've never read this before. Why has nobody ever told me who this guy is and what these books are? And I, I guess that sort of created a, a hunger and a thirst and a, a real interest in reading the Church Fathers. Um, and you've sort of answered the question a bit. You've talked around it. But my, 
when, when I've, I've been occasionally visiting Tappany at, um, at Our Saviour Ruthren, and when I've not been there, I've been going to uh, an Eastern Orthodox church nearby as well, an Antiochian church. Um, so my slightly polemical question then is, I've rediscovered the church fathers, I've rediscovered this roots of the ancient Christian faith, and I've fallen in love with liturgy, and I've I've totally bought the reality of sacraments and the and the the, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, why why should I bother stopping off at Luther? Why shouldn't I just go and you know the, this trunk that is there, which is the which is the ancient church in preserved in the in the Eastern Orthodox tradition? Why don't I just skip past Canterbury, skip past Rome, skip past Wittenberg, just go straight to Antioch and Constantinople? All right, you know what. I need to grab a book to answer that question. So can you wait one second? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only just right over here. If I can find it on the shelf, there it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's the Bible. <laughs> no, the, 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 the short answer to, to the question is if, if you, If the Orthodox were what they claim that they are, as you know that they are the, they are the preservers of the ancient church's teaching, then then you would be right to go there. Um, I, however, have a hard time granting that that is what they are, and I have a number of things that sort of gave me pause. But let me just share one that you know this is in. Um, the, the service book of the Antiochians, okay? And it is a prayer to the all-holy Theotokos that is after communion. So after you've received the sacrament of the altar, you pray, O all-holy lady Theotokos, light of my darkened soul, my hope, my shelter, my refuge, my consolation, and my joy. I thank thee that thou hast to count it me worthy, although unworthy, to be a partaker of the immaculate body and precious blood of thy son. But do thou who gave us birth to the true light enlighten the mental eyes of my heart. O thou who didst bear the fountain of immortality, quicken thou me who lie dead in sin. O compassion loving mother of the merciful God, have mercy upon me and grant me humility and contrition of heart and meekness in my thoughts and deliverance from the bondage of my vain imaginings and account me worthy even unto my last breath to receive without condemnation the sanctification of the immaculate mysteries unto the healing of both body and soul and grant unto me tears of repentance and confession that I may hymn thee and glorify thee all the days of my life. For blessed and glorified art thou unto all ages. Amen. I would maintain that you're not going to be able to find in the sacred scriptures a command to pray like that to the most holy virgin or a, a promise about doing so, or you will not find an example of anyone in the sacred scriptures doing that and you don't find it in the earliest centuries of the church either. You do have this weird phenomenon in orthodoxy that if anything gets established in church practice for any length of time, it is taken to have been by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and therefore it's basically irreformable. The development of the orthodox church is fundamentally, in their picture, irreformable. Against that, you have the words of these church fathers who would say, how does this stack up with the scriptures? Can you show that from the scriptures? Can you prove that from the scriptures? And if you can't, there might be a problem here, Houston. Um, you know, we need, we need to be able to uh, teach as dogma or uh, as practice, like this prayer would do, um, that which is actually congruent with and can be harmonized with the sacred scriptures. I mean, to me, that's the early church's position, and it's really clear. Um, I was trying to think of another area. I can, I can think of it. Um, so, for example, the Orthodox celebrate um, August 15th uh, as the Dormition of the Theotokos. Um, uh, so do Lutherans, actually. I mean, we celebrate, you know, it's the day of Mary's falling asleep. But the 
the idea that that we know for sure that her body was taken to heaven, you know, um, or that we know for sure what what happened there at the end, you know, that the apostles all gathered. You know, there's two traditions: was it at Jerusalem? Was it at Ephesus? Where was it? Um, they still proclaim it's it's all true um, that it happened this way. But if you read a, a church father like um, Saint Epiphanius, he says, "Well, we don't know how Mary's life ended." And anybody who says that, well, you know, we just don't know. So there was clearly a time where the ortho, where, where a person that would be regarded as an Orthodox saint would be saying, um, "We don't know." And yet now, centuries later, there is absolute. I mean, you compare that to like when Saint Germanus of Constantinople writes about it. It's like, or John of Damascus, either one. They're like, "This is absolutely certain and for sure." Mm. Well, if it wasn't certain and for sure back in uh, in the three hundreds, how is it certain and for sure in the six hundreds? Uh, that becomes sort of problematic, I think, in Orthodoxy's general approach. Um, and because they actually anchor so much in tradition, and I want to be clear, they don't picture Orthodoxy as their scripture and then their tradition. They regard scripture as the most important part of tradition, right? You know, it's, it's, um, but, but we say it is the most important part because it's the part that's actually incorruptible, infallible. It, it, it actually is, is there, there's no way to, to corrupt what it actually says. I think, um, I think one of the metaphors I, mean, I heard was that the, um, the you know, where scripture is part of tradition, the table of contents at the front of your Bible, what that table of contents says is the tradition, right? So do you include yeah. certain books or exclude certain books? That's a, that's a fact of a tradition, isn't it? 39 articles would dictate what's in it. The Lutheran confessions would dictate right, what's in it. Right. That's, a, that's an expression of tradition. Actually, it's interesting. The Lutheran confessions nowhere tell you what's in scripture. Oh, right. Um, okay. In fact, they, they refer to the book of Maccabees as scripture. Okay. Um, so uh, it, it's fascinating to me on that. If you actually go back to the Orthodox Fathers, you read uh, St. John or St. Gregory of Nazianzus's um, on man. And he, he gives you a list of the canon in there that's basically the Protestant canon. He doesn't have anything else. Um, and that's his take. Similarly with St. Athanasius' um, synodal uh, Easter letter, right? Where he lists out his take on the canon. Again, it's a smaller canon. Canon actually across the history of the church has never had more than a lot of, um, it has huge local implications. It's a statement of, these are the books that the church at this time and in this place is holding as the authoritative scripture. Uh, so Lutheranism has always had uh, a view of the canon that's kind of unique among the uh, the Protestants. We don't say that it's it's closed, and uh, there are Lutherans, for example, who will argue. Ah, I, I, there's problems from Eusebius onward about like uh, Second Peter and, and its relationship to the Book of Jude. Um, and some even with the revelation itself, a revelation the Orthodox never read yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. in a church service, right? You know, yeah. so um, Lutherans have always been like, okay, we can deal with that. You know, you can, you can, there can be room in the church for this kind of discussion. But we said the church is, what you can't do is change history. So in the early church, if a book was spoken against by the early witnesses, we simply said, you can't take a dogma and build it on a passage only from one of those spoken against books. They can be used to confirm all of the teachings that are found in the books that nobody disputed. So if, if Lutherans have a quote canon within a canon, that's how they've tended to do it. But it wasn't based on Luther's theological ideas. It was just based on the history of how the books were first collected and kept. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that really helps. I mean, I don't want to hijack it at all and Tapani can tell me to stop talking, but the, I suppose the, the fundamental of my question is really one of ecclesiology, right? So, so the, the Eastern Orthodox will make the claim of being the original true church and the everybody church. else branched off, right? Everyone else, and yeah, okay, you may be heretical or you may just be heterodox uh, and, that's, and that's probably how they would label you and I. It's just heterodox to say, okay, you've got most of it, but you're not quite there. Um, and, I, and I guess that's what I'm not able to quite square. And I can sort of square that from an Anglican perspective, because, you know, an Anglican, somebody like Tim, who I think is ordained, um, Tim could, could trace his ordination to an Anglican bishop who can trace his ordination back through a chain of bishops, right? And you've got that sort of, 
I don't know. I don't want to go down a whole thing about the about apostolic succession, but I, I guess that's that, it, it, it. Sure. It's it's that so, I mean that that part of the tradition and the history and that you know if if the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, then how do we get to a position where we've got X thousand of Protestant denominations now and and we're having this conversation at all? It's yeah, well, I guess it's a, it yeah. fundamentally it's the ecclesiology question that I'm not quite able to square. Well, notice that the fact that we're having the conversation is a testimony to the fact that the, the Holy Spirit has preserved the church because Christians are still getting together and talking about these things. Um, I do think, I, I think the, uh, it's really important to address the apostolic succession question. And, and the Lutheran way of addressing that is not often credited. It, I mean, I don't know if uh, maybe Pastor Tapani can put up the um, link to Heath Curtis's paper on this. But um, he basically says, you know, the, the syllogism is with, without, without bishops, there is no church. Lutherans do not have bishops. Lutherans are not church. He points out that the Lutheran confessions actually do not attack the first statement. They go after the middle statement that Lutherans do not have bishops. And they most certainly, they, they assert, oh, yes, we do. And they do so on the basis of actually the witness of the scriptures and of the church fathers. I mean, you can't ignore a, a figure as colossal as St. Jerome saying that, hey, bishops need to remember that insofar as they differ from presbyters, it's more by right of human custom than by any divine mandate. So mm. once you lay that out, and that's the case, then you're like, the Lutherans were like, so because we believe in a unitary office, um, it, it's totally possible to speak of our guys being in office and in apostolic office. Um, the Lutherans, as they discuss, oh, I think he's hung, he's hung up. <laughs> no. I don't know how I can't finish that sentence, so we have to wait. <laughs> I've got, I need to unlock the. Um... Hang on. John, can you unlock the meeting so that... Uh, oh, there you go. Oh, no. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, here we go. Coming back, coming back. Welcome back. You're muted. Unmute. There okay. You go. Welcome Sorry, back. I am. I, I, what happened? Um, uh, can I go back to where I was in the conversation? Yeah, please do. Is that okay? Okay. So the the, the, the interesting thing to, is is that once the Lutherans granted that uh, the, that the history had to be factored in in the Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue, they actually convinced the Roman Catholic participants here in America to recommend to Rome that they recognize the validity of Lutheran orders, they said valid but irregular. And they pointed out across history, of course, there had been abbots who were in presbyteral orders who ordained other presbyters. There had been um, two medieval saints, uh, Willahad, and I can't remember the name of the other one, who in their missionary situation um, in Northern Germany had actually ordained as presbyters. They became, they were later bishops, but they ordained presbyters as presbyters. And Pete Korn, um, in his discussion with the uh, Roman Catholics, said, so either these guys were, were, they were foisting material idolatry on the church if they didn't have the authority to actually consecrate the Eucharist as presbyters who had to have been ordained by presbyters, or there are extraordinary circumstances where it is totally possible to have a presbyter ordain a presbyter, and it would be valid by divine right. So, um, I think the, the whole area of apostolic succession is one that needs to be examined in detail, but I think the Lutheran argument totally holds up there, and uh, I just, I don't see how you can have a problem with it. I've just posted in the chat, uh, just the, uh, the, the article by Pastor Curtis is, is not currently not online. The, the site on which it was posted is no longer, uh, no longer active, but I've quote, quoted a uh, the these um, if like the uh, a, a section from it that defends okay the, thank you so yeah, Andy you can read that at your uh, at your leisure you thank know you. before we before we move on can I add one more thing on it, it yeah. it's also worth noting that Gerhardt Gerhardt 
writes, um, you know, he's the great, uh, the great uh, dogmatician. Um, he writes, we vehemently disapprove of the anarchy and disturbance of those who remove ranking or ordo from ecclesiastical ministry, since it is a source of discord and of every evil. In our churches, we retain ranking among ministers and decree that this must be retained so that some are bishops, some are presbyters, some are deacons. Right. And he just lays it out. That is the form of the church's ministry. In the United States, the great... Um, Found, oh, the founder of the Missouri Synod, C.F.W. Walther, in his little book on the on the ministry, he says, "Hey, this is just this little synopsis. If you really want the full story, you need to go read Gerhard." There it is. So here's my question then: Where did it all go wrong for us? Well, I think that things really went wrong for us when we, especially, I'm thinking of you, I honestly don't know the history of the church there in England, so I don't know if you guys We, we were, were until 1950s an outpost of the Missouri Synod. Okay, that's what I thought. All right, Atlantic so District. if you guys, if, if you guys, if you guys inherited from us, then when you come to America, you have all of the entire, I mean, in fact, Walter's, the title of Walter's book is fascinating. He's like, so the full title is something along the lines of, so what do we do when the government is no longer there to arrange for the shape of the Christian congregation? How might we best do it in a way that serves the purposes of God? You know, he's trying to unpack this very difficult um, thing. I mean, and, and the frontier answer Missouri came up with was a, what do we call it? It's a synodal congregation. It's not just congregation. It's like this weird blend of congregationalism and Presbyterianism mushed together into uh, into into a synodal picture. And uh, so the Missouri Senate basically gave that to you guys, which has all the strengths of a system that works if everybody is a convinced Lutheran and which will totally fail and fall on its face. It has no backups, no guards. If people say that they're Lutheran, but they're not committed to what the Lutheran confessions actually teach. And then I think it gets as rotten as spoiled milk. Thank you. Uh, should we move on to something entirely different now? Uh, a little light relief. What's your favorite hymn and why? Ah, Lord, thee I love with all my heart. Can you tell me it's a little bit Lutheran. about that hymn? Because not everybody here will know that hymn. So tell, tell us a little bit about it. Will you permit me to actually just read the words first? Is that permitted? Through sing, yeah, yeah, sing, yeah. sing, 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 sing. No, give I'm not going to. No, give I'm us a history sing. briefly, if you if you can, and then share share with us. Okay, um, it, it, it is a hymn by a Lutheran pastor, Martin Schalling, um, and it it he wrote it as he was getting ready to be basically foisted into exile. Um, and his heart was really breaking as he wrote it. And yet his great trust in the word of God to actually prevail and conquer is what really rings through the peace. It probably is the most beloved piece of most, I, I think uh, uh, all the pastors that know it say, that better be sung at my funeral. So let me just give the words. I mean, it, it, it's so beautiful. Lord, and it's basically a riff on Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but thee, and there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So, Lord, thee I love with all my heart. I pray thee ne'er from me depart with tender mercy. Cheer me. Earth has no pleasure I would share. Yea, heaven itself were void and bare if, th bare if thou, Lord, wert not near me. And should my heart for sorrow break, my trust in thee can nothing shake. Thou art the portion I have sought. Thy precious blood my soul has bought. Lord Jesus Christ, my God and Lord, my God and Lord, forsake me not, I trust thy word. Yea, Lord, twas thy rich bounty gave my body, soul, and all I have in this poor life of, of labor. Lord, grant that I in every place may glorify thy lavish grace and help and serve my neighbor. Let no false doctrine me beguile. Let Satan not my soul defile. Give strength and patience unto me to bear my cross and follow thee. Lord Jesus Christ, my God and Lord, my God and Lord, in death thy comfort still afford. And this last stanza is actually prescribed in our um, 
commendation of the dying to be sung to the dying as they are dying. Lord, let at last thine angels come to Abram's bosom, bear me home that I may die unfearing and in its narrow chamber keep my body safe in peaceful sleep until thy reappearing. And then from death awaken me that these mine eyes with joy may see, O Son of God, thy glorious face, my Savior and my fount of grace. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without end. And the tune is as strong as the words. And uh, I mean, to, you'll have to... Uh, to kind of, I mean, Bach, I can never remember the name of the, or the, the number of the cantata where it, I mean, it's, oh, it's the St. John Passion, right? Last, the St. Yeah. John Passion. St. John Passion closing yeah. chorale. Closing chorale is that stanza and uh, just beautiful, beautiful um, piece of music. Thank you. Which segues into a question, another question from John. So what is your opinion on the contemporary Christian music scene and the standard of songs being used in communal worship? Also, do you think that bands such as Koine, are you familiar with Koine? No. They're, a, I think they're Wisconsin students, uh, for folks, but they basically set uh, traditional, mostly Lutheran hymns uh, with the original tunes, but they play them as a sort of, in sort of, uh, sort of contemporary sort of band setting. They give uh, them a backbeat. <laughs> basically, yeah, and it's guitars and, and so on. Uh, who, uh, they attempt to bring traditional hymns into contemporary setting would you are they to be praised or rebuked so what's your view on the contemporary music christian music scene and um so modern songs and and the attempts to modernize if you like uh, hymns by by resetting their style well you know i definitely was of i mean I, th there was a time in my in my youth after i became a lutheran that i fell in with the charismatic lutherans and so I learned to love and sing a whole bunch of scripture choruses. And I still love a lot of the scriptural choruses, but I still have to say um, what I see in contemporary Christian music these days is not as strong as the old scripture choruses used to be. And, and I, I think that the hymnody is actually far, far, far richer. And not only is it richer, but it's actually designed for communal singing and not for, um, you know, a band or a, a select group performing. Over and over again, we hear this um, complaint in churches that have introduced a lot of the contemporary music. It's the people sit there and they, you know, they watch the praise band perform on stage or whatever. They don't actually join in the singing, but people come to our church. They're like, whoa, all the people are singing. It's like, well, of course we're singing. How can we not sing these glorious words? Um, so I absolutely treasure the church's hymnody across the centuries. And Lutherans of all people have this massive um, heritage of, of great hymns to sing from, from the time of the Reformation, both from the, the Scandinavian churches and from, uh, from, from Germany and, and frankly from Slovakia too. Um, and then add to that, we're speaking English. So, I mean, like you've got the Wesley brothers, you've got Isaac Watts, you've got all these people that were really decent theologians in the way that they approach the text. They had a, I don't think Charles Wesley has been bested in English for his ability to actually take scripture and put it into um, rhymed paraphrase and um, with depth of theological insight. Um, I mean, yeah, he, I, I know he sort of misses, he, you know, he stumbles on Hark the Herald, <laughs> but, but, but he's really good on the vast majority of what he does. And it's not an accident that a lot of these guys cut their teeth bringing some of the stuff over from, from the Lutherans in Germany, right? I mean, they, it, it, Wesley also did um, uh, the, um, ach, what's the Gerhardt hymn, uh, Gerhardt with a T um, on, um, Jesus, thy boundless love to me, right? I mean, that's that's actually um, a Gerhardt hymn that comes to us through Wesley, and it shows. Okay, so so no bands of St. Paul uh, Hamill, Illinois, then? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah, l l let's hope that, that, that we, we don't get banned. But now, having said that, that yeah, 
we really want the reason I'm a I, I really oppose bands per se is because the primary instrument to be used in the worship of God is the human voice. And anything that obscures that is not ideal to me. And I think that bands have it to anything that is electronically amplified has the tendency to distort and screw up the sound of the human voice. And I, I, I think the strength of, of organ or, or a, a real piano is they have the ability to support and sustain the singing. But even then, they need to be careful of not overwhelming it because the, the voice, I mean, we really need nothing but our voices to make a beautiful worship service to God, seriously. Thank you. Um, here's another question then that's come to us. Um, what would you say in a few minutes to somebody who comes from a completely non-liturgical church background and uh, and you, your job is now to convince them that they will be better off in a liturgical church, that is to say in a church where you have a set uh, liturgy and a liturgical customs? Well, the first thing I would say is don't be put off by the complication. How hard was it when you first learned to drive? You had to sit there and think about everything. Think about backing up at first when you're first learning it, right? It's complicated and hard and it can be off-putting. But you know what? Do you even have to think about it anymore when you're backing up and moving on down the street? You're fine. So don't be, don't be turned off by the complication. The complication is actually an added benefit because then it keeps it from getting tired. The, the liturgy is actually devised around immersing a person in the word of God and doing so with a set of things that never change, interspersed with the set of things that change every week. And the scriptures literally set the tone for the entire thing. So when you're doing liturgy, you are fundamentally being immersed in the word of God. When Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, um, I know another way that the word of God can dwell more richly than by taking those, um, you know, the ordinary, the stuff that is always the same and having that be totally screwed down in a framework and then inserting the things that change week by week, but that pick up one biblical truth after another and set it before the people. It's just a very rich way to live. And it's got, I think in the long run, a lot more scripture in it than you're ever going to find by doing some sort of freestyle thing freestyle it can be great but if you're doing it there's a real good chance you're not going to get the whole counsel of god being delivered all the time the church year which is what the the liturgy wraps around actually makes sure that the entire the whole counsel of god is proclaimed to the people of god every year and i think that's really important thank you is there anyone here who'd like to come back we've got we've got a few people here who come from some non-liturgical non Traditions. Does anybody want to kind of pick up on that? Here's your chance um, before we move on to uh, the next uh, question. Uh, maybe if I could, that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I come from a background that would be uh, exclusive psalmists, and we would believe in the regulative principle of uh, worship. So, of course, as I said, I'm on a bit of a journey at the moment. So, mm -hmm. I have found uh, from a lot of people from the reformed background, uh, they, you know, would really struggle, uh, from the Presbyterian side of things, with the whole uh, liturgical uh, setup, and then of course with mm -hmm. kind of images uh, of uh, of Christ and stuff like that. And uh, now they've started talking. I can't really remember what my question was going to be. Uh, I suppose maybe, uh, how would you respond to someone who says? Well, who would believe in the regulative, regulative principle that what is not commanded is uh, forbidden? Uh, thank yeah, I, I, I thank you. Um, first of all, Lutherans are envious of the, um, you know, the strict Calvinists who keep to the use of the Psalter. Um, we rejoice that the Psalter is used, and we, we, you know, we're still struggling to figure out what's the best way to do this. Um, we have these psalm tones that are kind of wonky in our hymnal, so we can still sing the psalms, but it's not nearly as nice as it used to be. I mean, the Gregorian tones were so much stronger and better, but harder to actually adjust to English. So, you know, hallelujah for the use of the Psalter. It is the church's primary hymn book. It must always be the church's primary hymn book. 
But the regulative principle per se, Lutherans disagree with in the idea that, um, if I'm saying it correctly, only what God commands in his word is to be done. Whereas in the Lutheran understanding, it's, it's inverted. It's only what God forbids in his word is not to be done in, in the church's worship. So then Lutheranism had this immense freedom toward the liturgical heritage of the ancient church. So we can sing a Te Deum Laudamus at our matin service. And it's, it's glorious. I mean, I don't know how any, anybody can disagree with the word, you know, when thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, that is not spurn the virgin's womb, thou hast overcome this, when thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou hast opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers, thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father, we believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. What in here is not, you know, gloriously biblical to sing? Um, so we, we are very happy to be open to that bigger heritage but at the same time, I really want to lift up and praise you, praise any of the Calvinists that are listening for the maintaining of the singing of psalms as the hymns of church. The, the Psalter is to be the songbook of the Christian people till the day, I, I suspect we'll be singing them in the kingdom. I mean, can you really see being in heaven and not singing uh, the king of love my shepherd is? I, I think we'll be doing it up there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a handbrake turn at this point, something completely different. Um, and this, I think, came from a discussion was held by uh, a couple of Tim and I and a couple of other sort of UK clergy from different traditions had a discussion on this topic as well recently. Um, uh, many Lutheran churches practice close communion, and yet they teach that um, yet they teach that the uh, the Lord's Supper is a meal for all Christians. Mm -hmm. How can you say that the Lord's Supper is a meal for all Christians and yet uh, close the Lord's table to Christians in your church? Can I answer that question on the other side of getting rid of this water that I just drank? Can I just be like, give me like three minutes, okay? That's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then I'll get back to it. I promise. That's fine. Small bladder. See you in a minute. Okay. See you in a minute. If you want to unmute yourselves and, and, and have a chat, first come, first serve, you, you feel more than welcome. Just a quick welcome to Joel, who's just joined us. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Can you tell us where you're from and what you do? Yes, I am a, a LCMS pastor in Cleveland. Yeah, I've been a pastor for 17 years. And uh, yeah, I have three kids beside that and uh, the house and three cars to take care of. And so, uh, Try to work hard and, and preach meaningful sermons and have good liturgy. Pastor Whedon is great at liturgy, so, of course. So, one well, reason I'm here, but thanks for all your comments on Twitter and your additions. Great, great to have you with us. Welcome. Um, if anybody's got any questions, is there anyone? Just wave at me if, if any questions have come to mind uh, or any questions you'd like to ask, because here's your chance. Um, uh, you know, yeah, Steve. I I, I, obviously, it's it's sort so of such an alien uh, world to us. I almost wonder how how has that happened that in our the reformed world, I was brought up in the reformed world. Hmm. There's such ignorance of Lutheranism, uh, and yet there seems to be no discussions between the two. Uh, is that you know with, there seems to have been discussions with other groups, but uh, you know even when I swing the hand arms, it was it was just a different. You know, I, I found everything I thought he believed, he didn't believe, and it, it took a long time to get through the nonsense to try and work out the traditions to where I was going on. What, is there a reason for that? Why it seems as if there's no discussion between the Reformed and the Lutherans and a lot of misunderstanding? There has been, there's, it's a historical accident in the UK, in the English speaking world, because uh, and on the continent, there's been a lot, and, and, and there's been very close relations between. Uh, you know, too close in some ways. There's been a lot of over historically sort of fudging of distinctive doctrines just to get them to into one church body. So yeah. you kind of lob off the things that make yeah. because they reform, reform, so you can just form one body. But in the UK, Lutherans just never historically arrived here. There was the early Reformation in England was Lutheran, but uh, very, you know, the, the, it just didn't, for various reasons, um, it uh, various influences led it in a more reform direction. And um, and it just got kind of set in stone. And then all the dissenting churches, including the Baptists, then broke off from there 
as opposed, you know, from what was already here. So, you know, and Lutherans, the only Lutherans in the UK until the 1890s were expats and they were licensed. You know, you could have a Swedish chaplain in the Swedish, Swedish embassy, but that, that was it. So it wasn't until 1894 that we had a congregation, Lutheran congregation in this country that wasn't intended for foreigners. But it's just some misunderstandings that I, I was shocked that things that I was taught Lutheranism taught, uh, especially about the, the Lord's Supper. Mm. which are more nuanced than meet the eye and baptism. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a, it doesn't seem in the States it's the same thing. They don't seem to, you know, everybody makes assumptions that don't seem to be true. Yeah, I don't. But I, I mean, I've been really, as you know, I've been really hugely blessed by uh, the loose threads. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it just an observation. I, I just wish there was a bit more interaction so there could be genuine understanding. Well, here we are. Here we are. Which is what you're doing now, which is fantastic. That's what we're doing, yeah. And it was great joy to be with you guys last year. Uh, you know that uh, <laughs> yeah, last year, and and, uh, uh, and and get to know some of you, which is wonderful. And and, and long may that continue. I was disappointed not to be able to return return this time for another conference. Uh, Joel has just pointed in the chat that if, of course, there's a history, particularly Lutheran history, particularly in the States, that the, a lot of the Lutherans who went to America, one reason they went was that they were forced forced by the state into a union with the Reformed right. to give up the Lutheran identity. So when they arrived in America, they weren't going to have any of that. Thank you very much. Um, but there is a lot of misunderstandings. The number of non-Lutheran Protestants I've come across, who they know about Lutheran, simply assume we're just Catholics who don't like the Pope. Yeah. But there's huge insights that you guys have got, mm. uh, which our traditions have, have missed, yeah. uh, which are, I, I think probably Tim feels the same, which are hugely helpful. Uh, well, is there a good systematic theology in Luther Lutheranism? Uh, how good is your Swedish? <laughs> well, yeah. That's yeah there, the there, there is. Um, I, I was being a bit facetious. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you don't... If you look on my shelves there, there's a long red line of books there on the top top shelf, but one. Can you see yeah. there in the middle? That's uh, Johann Gerhard's. All right. <laughs> okay. And to the to the right of you, you can just about see a green, couple of green books. And yeah. that's kind of good starting place of dogmatics by a gentleman called uh, Fra uh, Francis Pieper. He okay. was German born, immigrated to the States, uh, became... Uh, one of the leading theologians of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and he wrote actually, he lectured in Latin and, and taught in German in, in St. Louis, Missouri, but uh, he wrote, uh, and he's been translated into, into English, three volumes, Christian Dogmatics. Um, it's a little bit uneven in places, but it is kind of the, it's probably the, the Lutheran Dogmatics, if you're into uh, stuff. You, it's in print, you can get it. Um, sure. It's not particularly cheap, but, uh, and there's a summary of it as well that exists, a kind of a, a, a brief version uh, um, of it, but yeah, that's 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 probably the place to start. There are various German and Swedish and and, and Danish and Finnish guys who've written them as well, but you need to know some languages for that. <laughs> um, yeah, just a quick comment. That sorry, I, I came so late, but no, it's okay. um, a, a quick comment. There are popular, you know, presentations of Christian doctrine, like Edward Kaler's pastor. Yes, and, you know that are. Quicker reads, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I could put together a list if you, if you are interested of of just some. Yeah, of the we would. Ones. Yeah, yeah. We would be interested. Yeah, uh, Pastor Whedon, I'm really really sorry. Uh, we had the meeting locked and didn't re I didn't notice that you disappeared, so we've kept you outside the locked door. Okay, sorry about that. No, 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 it was my fault. Uh, we, we've been banging on there. We we didn't hear. Okay, so should I go back to the question, or are you guys in another area? Uh, just before we do, we've just been discussing yeah. uh, Lutheran uh, question was, uh, are there any good uh, Lutheran dogmatics? So I mentioned Gerhard and Pieper. Um, and then there's obviously the, the briefer ones like Kayla. And mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a brief, you know, even more recent one by Mueller, the uh, sort of textbook. Do you want to add anything to that? So things in print that are in English. Um, uh, uh, Martin Chemnitz says Loci Theologici. Yeah. Um, oh, is is very good uh, two volume set, or at yeah. least it used to be. I'm not sure how it it's is, printed it now. Still, yeah. It's still two, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, that gets you through most of it. I mean, obviously Gerhardt, he's just prohibitively expensive. I know. Um, 
the the very best honestly it, it's not in print but it's usually not hard to find is schmidt do, do you know that work um i know is, I, I don't have it it hold on one second nobody uh, where did he go to well <laughs> i he's on my shelf somewhere i don't know where he went i'll look um, it up and i'll share it yeah he he definitely he he's so useful because he actually summarizes all the dogmaticians he's not really going to are he doesn't argue theology he just summarizes what did all the dogmaticians teach about x y and c and parts of it can be very dry <laughs> if you need something to put you to sleep there's a lot of that but it's also very intense in giving you all of the information and doing it in a really well way um i think his his name just ends with a d not a dt i think schmid yeah, and what was the title? Is it just Christian Dogmatics or? No, no. See, <laughs> I, I I do have it. Um, yeah, I, I'll I'll look for it while you carry on. So so tell us about close communion. Heinrich okay. Schmidt doctrinal theology. There we go. Yeah. That's it. Doctrinal theology. I will I'll um, post a link in the chat while you talk. Great. Um, the. The question on closed communion needs to be fronted up. I mean, first of all, let me just begin by saying, I think our practice of closed communion is a cop-out. And I have believed it is a cop-out for a long time. And what I mean by that is, I'm not saying I believe in open communion. I'm saying what the confessions require of us is actually more than simply ascertaining, oh, are you a card-carrying um, Lutheran? <laughs> you know. Um, they actually say that we do not give the sacrament to those who have not been examined and absolved. And that's repeated a number of times in our confessions. And our practice now of basically just giving out the sacrament to people that we haven't taken the time to actually examine and talk to and then absolve them of their sins, I think it, I just think it's a cop out. So in the bigger scenario, I, you know, Lutherans don't give the sacrament to every Lutheran, even though we know that it's for all Christians, right? Um, in most congregations, there are children who are not yet communing. Um, and it, 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 similarly, you have people who are inquiring, they're on the way, but, they're, they, you know, it, it's for them, it's destined for them. Um, the sacrament is intended for every Christian. But Lutherans have also been really strong across the, the, the history of saying, you can't say, you need to be able to say yes to the words of Jesus that are that form the words of institution. You need to be able to say amen. If he says to you, this is my body, which is given for you and for the forgiveness of your sins, you need to be able to say amen. And if he says to you, this is my blood, which was shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, you need to be able to say, amen. That it is as you say, dear Lord. Um, so I think that uh, explains how we can say it's for us all, but we give it to those who are ready for that, who are, who are like that. Um, the, the analogy that, that the early church already began to use, they called it the, um, you know, the medicine of immortality. Well, think about a pharmacy, if you will. I mean, you need, to, you need to be sure that the person using it knows how to use it in a way that will bring blessing. Because, of course, it is possible to use the Lord's Supper in a way that does not bring blessing. St. Paul clearly teaches that in 1 Corinthians 11, right? It is possible to use the Lord's Supper in a way that brings judgment and aggravates judgment. And we don't want that. So we want to make sure that people know how to use it. That was the point of the examination <laughs> is that you talk to people one-on-one -on -one to find out where, it, where are you sinner? Where are you? Um, you know, d d have you been baptized? Do you believe the promises of God about your baptism? Do you believe the promises of God about supper? How are you doing in, in your walk with the Lord? Talk to me about your life. Um, this is, this is an important part of pastoral care, which uh, Lutherans at the beginning were really, really careful to guard and keep and maintain, and which has sadly fallen by the wayside. I mean, you, you might disagree with me on this, Tapani. I, 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 I don't know if we've ever talked about it before or not, 
I'm just convinced that uh, closed communion by itself is kind of a Lutheran cop out for doing the harder job. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I would subscribe to exactly what you've said in the last two minutes, three minutes. Um, I mean, one of the pastoral difficulties a Christian comes to a Lutheran congregation a service on a Sunday. And, you know, you pray, you know, for three minutes before the service starts, can I have communion? And you have that conversation. And it'd be so much yeah. easier if we could say, actually, our practice is that it doesn't matter where you're a member, whether you're our member or whether you come from Mars, <laughs> this is what we do. I'm sorry you haven't been, you have meetings that we haven't had that conversation. If you want to have the conversation, let's talk. But today you haven't yeah. been, you know, you haven't been examined today. None of the members of this church who have been examined aren't communing either. And 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 that would kind of take away the, the, the pastoral angst. That is such a difficult Absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. And, and, and you know what it would really do, too? I mean, because I, I really want to stress that one's public confession is a part of, I mean, an important part of, of, of a worthy reception of the sacrament. But it is not an exclusive part, because one can most certainly have the right confession, if you will, I mean, an orthodox confession, and be an absolute impenitence. And hopefully conversation will reveal that. And, and in that case, that person should not be communing, even if they're a card carrying member of the, the, the English Lutheran Church or of the, uh, um, the Missouri Senate. Does anyone want to come, come back? Any, any questions? I know because I've had conversation with various of you uh, over the time, over time um, about the, this question. Does anyone, anyone want to challenge or, or respond? While you're thinking about that, just to say um, there is uh, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, who was our first pastor in, in the hot seat a few uh, few months ago now. Uh, he, he's, he's one of his gifts to the church is that he continue, he constantly provides all, you know, reprints things. And uh, I'm just going to put a link, uh, first of all, for you, for where you can buy a Schmidt's book, Doctrinal Theology of the Evangelical mm. Church on Lulu, or if you prefer, a free PDF. Uh, and this is thanks to Ian, who's just uh, shared it with us. Um, in oh, fact, thank you, Ian. Yeah, if you just, Ian, can you just post it to everyone? You, you, I think you, oh, you did. Yeah, Ian has just posted the link, so you can click on that link. You get a PDF for Heinrich Schmitz and Doctrinal Theology of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. So if you are doctrinal, if you're into dogmatics, there's your, there's, there's, there's how you get, uh, you get into it. So does, yeah. does it, did anyone want to ask it, about or yeah, uh, about it, the, uh, closed communion? Uh, yeah, can I, can I, can I ask one? So I, I guess it's sort of a pastoral one as well. So I'll be completely transparent and give you to so the so the the story is I'm you know convinced by the the reality of the sacrament and convinced convinced that yes this is my body this is my blood I have bought that completely bought that uh, and I'm dipping my toe now in different um, historic confessions right um, and I come to Tappany and I come to to our Savior Lutheran and I say you know I I I get it I really get it. Um, and I and I pour my heart out in confession, and you know, and yeah, I'm, uh, I've I've got it, and I've left my old church, and I'm looking, you know, basically, then you get into the okay, the sacrament means something, and I get that it means something. Pastor Tappany, please give me the sacrament, and he can't, right? So so then I go, oh okay, right, well he can't because because I'm not a card carrying Lutheran, and I get that, I've got to go through the the, the cate catechesis and. Um, and then, well, you know, I could just go to the Church of England down the road um, because because it's an open table and I can go and I can and I can take the sacrament there. So I, I guess you get into this really interesting, I guess, from your perspective, this sort of pastoral um, dilemma of, you know, I, I believe you know, I, I fully believe the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and, I'm, you know, whatever that means. Um, and, I, and I want to take it. But then you get the well, okay, but you, but you can't. And I guess that's the pastoral reality, right, of the closed table argument is that then how long does it take before I can actually receive the sacrament, right? So how long does it take me to to sign on the dotted line and say I want to become a Lutheran, um, or or do I get bored part way through that process and just just go to the to the Anglican Church down the road? Well, um, you know, okay, that's not that, a threat, Tappany. Great... Sorry, that's... no, no, please talk amongst <laughs> yourselves. I'm not here. <laughs> that, that, that is a great question, and, and I think it's really helpful if we if we can back up just a little bit and notice 
Notice that the word Lutheran does not occur in the Book of Concord. There is no consciousness of Lutheran. It's the Christian Book of Concord. Um, and it has a, a way then of picturing the church that would, I mean, I think if you begin by saying, do I have to become a card carrying Lutheran? The Lutheran confession would say, what is that? <laughs> you know? So when you say, I am baptized, and when you say, I've repented of my sins, and you can you know, be examined and absolved by your pastor, and at that point, you really, yeah, I have trouble saying to a person at that point, well, sorry, you haven't done X, X, or Y. Um, the, the, the small catechism is, is, is what we tend to say as our sine qua non of, of, of having studied to become a Lutheran. And that honestly is so, so rich and yet at the same time so big. Is sick? I don't understand how any Christian reading it would go, well, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, I just don't get that. Um, so the person that can say, yeah, I, I'm saying I'm into that. I'm saying, I think, well, what did Tapani say at the beginning of this? I think you might be a Lutheran and not know it yet. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that, that's the way that, that I would approach it. It's like, well, you know, baptism has given you, baptism makes you be the heir of the table, period. It makes you be the heir of the table. And, and so what's, what's given at the table, um, as long as what you are, you know, in your private confession absolution, you are saying, that's what I believe, what, what Jesus said. I'm, I'm agreeing with what Jesus said. I'm going to say, well, okay, then let's talk about welcoming you to the table now. Let's confirm you now, if I can put it, if you're going to use the rate of confirmation to welcome people in, that's the time to do it. Um, to, Confirmation by itself for Lutherans, that's a whole other mess. I don't even, I don't even want to try to get into. It's, it's just, I, we are about as disagreed on confirmation as we are on anything in the world. I mean, we just do not have the same approaches on it. And Luther at the beginning was, you know, he just basically got rid of it. There was no such thing. Instead, you were baptized. You were catechized, you know, taught the faith and, and uh, you were welcome to the table. And they did this to kids as young as seven years old, you know, or actually it's, it's just less than seven in the Danish church order. So, I mean, you know, the, the idea of having this long process, you have to go through the pastor's class or whatever. I think that's actually not the way that Luther himself would have even understood it. They preached regularly on the catechism and they encouraged people to come to the to the sermons on it. And the idea is you're never done with the catechism because you're never going to outgrow the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the words of institution of the sacraments. There, there's a depth there that simply is you're going to swim in, in, in it for eternity. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, and I can't answer for what the situation there in England is. I don't know what your practice there is. Here in the United States, it's all across the board on what people actually do for this um i don't even agree fast. with myself on it so there you go okay all right there we go <laughs> uh, ray had a question also um yeah well um a lot of it was answered um um uh, previously but also when when you talk about examining the 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 communicant uh if i understand uh what paul wrote to the currency i think he said they let the person examine himself Mm -hmm. So it's the recipient's responsibility to check that uh, he's worthy or she's worthy to take the communion. So if I'm, for example, visiting a church somewhere, why would I, you know, I go there, you know, 10 o'clock or 10.30 when the service starts and I want to communicate. And I, of course, I understand that um, a communion is a very serious business. But mm -hmm. if I take it worthily, why should I be then questioned there before I can take the communion? You know, if it's the Lord's table, sure. it's not, um, you know, so I have a right. problem with the close communion, close, uh, it, it, close communion. I think the best way to, to get at that is to recognize the communicant has a responsibility to examine themselves. Absolutely. It's also true that the pastor is a steward of the mysteries and he has to answer to Christ for how he's distributed the sacrament. And so he needs to be able to assure himself that that person has, has examined themselves. The, the point of the pastoral examination is ultimately, has the person examined themselves? Do they recognize their sin? Are they ready to receive the sacrament? And you're not really passing judgment on them. You're just trying to ascertain, is this a Christian who understands what they're receiving here um, and has prepared for it in this way? Um, so, I mean, again, it's not like he's, uh, I don't picture him like a policeman, picture him much more 
like um, a doctor inquiring about how you're doing in your in your spiritual health. Um, so uh, in that sense, there, I mean, there's no question. St. Paul says, examine yourself. Interestingly enough, he also doesn't give the option. He doesn't say examine yourself and decide whether or not to come in. He says, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Because for Paul, the idea that you could examine yourself and decide to remain in unrepentance, that's not on the table. You know, it's like if you examine yourself and you see the sin, you repent and then you go to the table. If you examine yourself and you see that, okay, my faith is, is it, it, I, I'm agreeing with what Christ says here. I, I don't know, I'm not conscious of any open rebellion of sin in my life. Um, you still go to the table and receive forgiveness for all of our sin, for all of our life as a whole. So I, I hope that's explained somewhat. I, I just think everybody has a responsibility. And I also add the congregation has a responsibility. If you bring a guest in, they, they have the responsibility to tell the guest, hey, this is how we practice communion at our church. Um, and this is why we do it. Can you can we explain why we do it? And uh, I, I, yeah, just a way of making sure that we actually are doing what St. Paul said. That's the best I can do. <laughs> I mean, I, I would just, if you like, add to that, it's, it's a, it's an aspect of pastoral care. That yeah. you know, it, it's an, it's an expression of care and concern and love for the well, the spiritual well-being, given the warnings that are attached to unworthy. So, you know, the way that I explain it when I'm, you know, preparing people for first communion is to say, I'm going to ask you some questions, you know, like being confirmed, and uh, you know, the the blanket question is the one that you referred to is you know, do you believe that the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church as you have learned it from the small catechism is faithful and true and you're going to say yes and as part of due diligence i have taught it to you first so that i know that when you say it you know what you're talking about uh and it's that kind of I, that likewise when we say you know i i know that you know when people come to communion it's a, what is it that you're seeking because this is what we are offering Yes. I said, can yes. you pass our hurdle? Here's our exam. And if you get 95% or more, you can come in. But rather saying, right, this is what's on offer here. Tell me what you're seeking. Yeah. And if the two yeah, match, yeah. then you come. If the two don't match, then we need to talk. And this is why I say, like, you know, if somebody says, you know, I want to come and drink juice and a bit of bread so that I can remember Jesus, I said, you can do that, but that's not what we're doing here. You have to go somewhere else where they do that. And right. if I say to you, right. we're offering the true body and true blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you might say, oh, hang on a second. That's not what I was here for. So it's, it's that, that kind of honesty and integrity in the in the relationship. And, and, and you can't have that without having that conversation. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Bruce. I, 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 sorry. I just like to say, I, I really disagree with what's been said just now. That the reason I'm a member of this church is because it's so clear cut that most churches don't have the confidence to do what the ELC does. And I mean, if if you go down that road that you're suggesting, it seems to me like uh, Raisha, sorry, I don't know the pronunciation, Raisha uh, says, you know, you're going into a judgmental situation. Uh, which I don't think is good, you know. I mean, you might as well be an Anglican or a Roman Catholic, really. I would say from what you're saying to me. I, I mean, Judas Iscariot was at the last last supper. You know. I'm sure he drank and ate. So can and I just that, be clear? You know, I just like this. I just like it the way it is. That's what I'm saying. So uh, can I just be really clear? Are you you're saying that practicing close communion is what we should do or what we should not do? Yeah, yeah, closed is okay because you say you've gone through this. It's not perfect. I mean, the catechism, but the people who are in that communion, in that church, taking communion, have reached a certain level. You know, it's. Um, like constant consubstantiation, they agree with things like that. Uh, it's never going to be perfect, but uh, you know, you're saying you're starting to put a lot of judgment into it, as far as I'm concerned. You know, you lose a lot of what attracted me to this church. 
if you if you change it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, possibly I missed a lot of that. It, oh, basically, sorry. Bruce. Bruce. I think if I can summarize what Bruce said, they, Bruce, your connection is a little bit, a uh, little bit hard to follow because it, it keeps cutting out. But I think oh, what sorry. you what you were saying is that one of the things that attracted you to Lutheranism was the clarity. Yes. And and uh, and therefore the practice of of close communion is part of that clarity. Yeah. Um, so that we you know we we you know the, everybody's absolutely good. This is what we are. Who we are. This is what we offer. This is what uh, and 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 to water that down would be detrimental is that is that yeah. a fair summary yeah 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 let me add i i 100 am not in favor of watering any of it down i just think the clarity is a clarity of confession not of institution it's the clarity of the you know the articulation the confession of what you know what the christian church what the lutheran church the christian church believes about the lord's supper um, and I think that's that's really, really important, which means that there might be people who could be communing um, under expect, exceptional circumstances. In other words, that the, the World Council of Churches, when it clarifies what it stands for, for your church and mine on communion, were listed as limited open communion. What do they mean by that? They mean the table is not absolutely closed because both of us recognize there are pastoral situations where you can actually have somebody come to the table who shares the confession of the truth, but who is still not a Lutheran. If I can put them in, does that make sense? Is that fair? Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have six minutes left. Um, we had a question from uh, just a, this is a really short one, uh, okay. I, I hope. Would you say that uh, Converts to Lutheranism tend to be doctrinally sharper and, and clearer than cradle Lutherans. And if so, why do you think that might be? Yes, beyond shadow of doubt. And I think that tends to be the case because they've been searching before and they've discovered a treasure that they're not about to let go of. So as they discover Lutheranism, they just rejoice in all the, well, I think that cradle Lutherans sometimes, not, not you, <laughs> Cradle Lutherans have a tendency to uh, focus on the things they have in common with everybody else and not the things that are Lutheran distinctives, whereas the Lutheran converts became Lutherans because of the Lutheran distinctives. And I think that just plays out in how they uh, they pay attention to the doctrine. Thank you. That was uh, mm -hmm. short and uh, sweet. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Barbara, it looks like Barbara, you're trying to speak, but you're muted, so we can see your mouth moving, but we can't hear a thing. So if you can unmute on your screen, please. That's it. Nope, still no. So can you hear me yeah, now? Yeah. Yes, that's it. Oh, okay, I had to put it on and off. Um, I kind of want to go back a little bit to what we were talking about just now. Um, and uh, first of all, to, to um, my knowledge that, um, well, we had two world wars and uh, Lutherans were not considered uh, proper in, the U in, in England. So we have the Church of England, which was built on Lutheranism. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, and I feel that um, it's a shame that obviously not many people go to church these days. So our church isn't growing. Um, but the Church of England built on Martin Luther, but they couldn't have Lutherans after two world wars. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I think that um, certainly we could sell ourselves a bit more. I don't, and that's the wrong word in selling ourselves. But um, I feel that because nowadays hardly anyone goes to church, um, we, we're now sort of left in a bit of a, an area where why can't we share God's word to other people? Um, and I sort of feel that there, there should be ways. Um, and uh, what am I trying to say at this point? Um, that maybe it's 
it, it's a good idea to try and get them into church before we give them all the information that they have to have about being part of the church. So whether we should go back to what we did years ago, which was actually um, posting letters through people's doors and saying we're opening up our church, would you like to come and see what's going on and things like that. Uh, thank you. Can I just ju jump in here to say that the, the Lutheran Church in England doesn't, in recent years, doesn't have a particularly glorious uh, <coughs> reputation as an evangelistic and missionary church. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I shan't name mention there's a person in this meeting who, after joining our church, after about six months said, you know, I, I figured out that Lutherans don't really believe in evangelism, but... <laughs> uh, which which made my heart a little bit uh, a little bit colder than it uh, it that is comfortable. Um, so that that's just as a, as a little bit of a, a background. But uh, Pastor Whedon, do you want to say anything to that? I mean, you know, the, the Lutheran Church is certainly um, hugely indebted to in English, in anybody speaking English, to the Anglican Reformation, and. Uh, you know, many ways, Lutheranism and Anglicanism were kissing cousins for a long time along the, the road. Um, obviously, there was more of a um, reform tilt to Anglicanism at, at some points. But, um, you know, th th there's just a lot that, that we have in common. And so if the first Luther, if the first prayer book of, of, of Edward was actually really like the Cologne Reformation, it was a, it was a Lutheran book. Um, the Lutherans, uh, the Anglicans returned the favor because when Lutherans came into English, we just borrowed the, the Book of Common Prayer uh, text for almost everything except for the Psalms. And which is sad because I still love God has gone up with a Mary, with, with a Mary shot the Lord with the sound of a trump. Uh, I love that. Um, but the, 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 the reaching out, the, the, the gospel message, this is something that I think all all Christians across the board struggle with these days um, as the unwelcomeness of our message grows and our invitation um, to the world. I, I think honestly, the fact that when Christians are actually sharing the truth, the world smells resurrection on this and is scared by the smell and fears it. And I think that's actually where we need to be. We need to be at the point of making the world be scared and afraid. <laughs> Of, 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 of literally the message that we're bringing because they're going to be like, that's alien. That's weird. That's an invasion into everything that we've ever assumed. And we're like, yeah, it is. It's the invasion of divine love and forgiveness that will totally transform your life and turn you upside down and inside out. And boy, if we can get Lutheran sharing the joy of that gospel again, I think it would be a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Which brings us exactly on the, the dot of nine o'clock. Uh, we planned this carefully and it worked perfectly. <laughs> uh, is there, please wave at me if there's something that you're really desperate to say and haven't had the opportunity to ask or to comment. Um, David uh, in Northern Ireland, very quickly. Yeah, I feel kind of bad because uh, I've had a couple of comments, but, uh, but yeah, I suppose in one sentence, if you could summarize the difference uh, in the Reformed and the Lutheran perspective, on the law and the gospel, that would be great. I know that's a big ask, mm. but it's something that I'm trying to get my head around. Thank you. Mm. Boy, that's a, that is a really great one. Um, the, the, the easiest way to summarize it is to say, read Herman Sasse's little book on this. <laughs> he, he says the difference is at first it's so it's like it's like a railroad where they they were laid in parallel at the beginning, but there was just a slight deviation. And it comes down to this, for the Lutherans, the gospel, um, the forgiveness of sins is the sole content of the gospel. And for the Calvinist, the Reformed, the forgiveness of sins is the primary content of the gospel. And it sounds so similar, but the result is as time goes on that these two really diverge quite, quite distinctly. Hermann Zasha, like I said, in um, his little book on What's that book called? To uh, here, here I stand. Here, here I stand. stand. Or here we stand. Here we stand. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, here we stand. That book actually gives that very, very beautifully done. That's good. Thank you so much. Uh, 
after mm -hmm. we thank you okay. um, thank you we have now overrun by two minutes so we we've compensated for the loo break in the middle ah. uh, so i think you've you we, we've extracted our, our pound of flesh out of you um can i just say uh how very very grateful we are that you've given us uh the sort of best hours of the day uh for us i personally i'm speaking for myself but i think i'm speaking for others as well it's been just as uh, stimulating and uh, rewarding as we were expecting and hoping. Uh, God has blessed you with a gift of enthusiasm uh, coupled with an intellect and learning, uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, which is a great blessing to us all. So we thank you and we wish you God's uh, richest blessings um, for your, your work, both at the, in the parish and, and with your teaching through Lutheran Public Radio. And uh, we we hope and pray that this is not the last time that we get to talk, and maybe we'll arrange one another one of these sometime down the line. We'll give you a bit of time to rest and recover from our accents. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yes, uh, we'll tell that story another time. But uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to everybody who's joined us tonight. It's been delightful to have you all, um, and thank you for everyone who everyone who asked questions um, and, and 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 with their comments and simply for being here and supporting it. Um, spread the word. If you, if you thought this was a good idea, the next time it comes around, we, we hope to have this every few months. This was number three now. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, have some more. So invite your friends and relations um, uh, to come along and, and waves and strays as well, um, if, that's, if, 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 that, if, you, if you find any. So thank you all. Uh, Shall we just close, uh, close uh, with a, a word of thanksgiving to God and, and ask him for his blessing. So let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in love you sent your word in the flesh of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. We thank you that you have united us by faith into, in his, as members of his body. And we thank you now for the blessing that we have had tonight to share the riches of your word and to discuss the gift of salvation together. We ask that you would bless each one of us here, our loved ones, our churches, that you will continually bless the church uh, in the power and wisdom of your Holy Spirit, to unite us more and more in the confession of Christ's name, so that others too might hear the fame of our Lord Jesus Christ, be drawn to him, and you be united with us and with all the saints and angels in heaven in everlasting worship. And so with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. 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 Thank you very much indeed. God bless you all. Uh, thank have you. a very good night. Oh, Amen. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank th you so much. And thank you, Pastor Tapani, for being the host. You're so much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much, too. Cheers. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.